Welcome to the first of TEDx Calgary's interviews with remarkable people who are doing extraordinary things in a, in a number of disciplines and helping to spread ideas worth sharing. My name is Jonathan Perkins and I'm the curator of TEDx Calgary for 2015. Today we're joined by Dr. Henry Kim, formerly of the Ashmolean Museum and now the director and CEO of the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto. The museum is doing extraordinary things to share Muslim civilization history with Canada and the rest of the world. Dr. Kim, welcome to Calgary and perhaps tell us a little bit about yourself and your connection to the museum. What drew you into this work? Well, even though the Aga Khan Museum is a museum that concentrates on Islamic art, I'm actually a Greek archaeologist by training. Oh, excellent. And so I've spent my entire career, over 21 years, in museums and universities. And uh, I have to say that uh, that combination universities and museums is absolutely fantastic because the one thing that you learn from that experience is how you actually use objects for teaching. What information and stories you can draw out of them and how you can really use them as primary evidence. Mm -hmm. And that's really I think you know if you want to find out the background to what drew me to this museum it was actually that inquisitive study of objects and from that study becoming very interested in how cultures connect with one another and how objects are actually the mediators in that narrative. A lot of our viewers will be familiar with the British uh, Museum and BBC series The History of the World in 100 Objects and with that object focus of the museum, what are some of the objects that you think most express the, the journey of Muslim civilizations that the, mu the museum represents? For me, it's all of the objects that have cross-cultural associations. Um, I think that when people come and view the objects in the Aga Khan Museum, the one thing they'll be astounded by is that we don't just celebrate works of art as works of art. We celebrate them for what they can tell us about diversity, about multiculturalism, but I think most importantly about the way that cultures actually did interact and engage with one another over this 1400 year period. I think most people think of the Muslim world as being a very monolithic place. Uh, they think of it and equate it with the Arab world. Mm -hmm. And yet when you look at our museum, our objects, our collection, the one thing you realize is that it's a much more diverse set of cultures. And that these cultures not only interacted within the Muslim world, most importantly, they interacted with many cultures outside of it. So one of the objects, Dr. Kim, that struck me from the museum's website was the astrolabe and how that signifies a number of different connection points. Can you give us more context about why, what it means to you and why it's so important as part of the museum collection? Sure. And the astrolabe that we often talk about comes from Spain and it comes from the 14th century. Now, like many astrolabes, it's a wonderful scientific instrument. It shows you how, with knowledge of astronomy, you can use that knowledge to actually navigate around the world. Fantastic instrument. But for us, what's important about this scientific instrument is that it wasn't an object or knowledge that was held only by one culture. It was something that was shared by cultures, whether in Spain, whether in Cairo, whether in the Levant. Mm -hmm. It was also shared by many different peoples. And in the case of this astrolabe, it has on its face inscriptions both in Arabic and in Latin, which shows you Christians and Muslims using that instrument side by side, sharing in that knowledge. What makes this astrolabe particularly important is that on one of the dials, there's, there are scratchings that have been made in Hebrew. What other object is there that can actually talk about three different faiths, three different people, all living in Spain? And this is before the reconquest, before Spain became much more a single culture. And it shows you that Spain of this period was a very diverse society. That to me is you know, one of the objects that really does exemplify the fact that objects can tell you stories that most history books won't. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that when we visit a museum we, and we view objects versus actually handle them and interact with them, we, we don't get the context that the object existed in within its originating civilization. And mm -hmm. is the museum making any efforts to, to change the way we interact with some of the objects? A, a good example is um, the large carpets that I, that I understand you have. And 
that they would represent a life's work for a person and you know unless we see them in the context of the house um, and, and the workshop they're an object and so how do you tell the story of an object like that in this context? Yep. Contextualization is always tough because there are many different contexts you can tell the story of an object in. For us what's important is that people actually get a narrative that talks about maybe its creation, about multiculturalism if that's re relevant to it, perhaps even how it was uh, collected over time. I think museum experiences can't just be about one context. You have to actually introduce multiple contexts. And it may not be with one single object. Mm -hmm. It's collectively over the course of an exhibition, of, over the course of a permanent gallery, that you'll get little snippets of stories that give you an idea of how it was used originally, how it may have been reused later, how it may have been collected, and how it may form important parts of museum collections. All of these are relevant. I think the story of the manufacturers, the artists who, who, who created these, are very powerful stories because you get straight back to the person who handled it. And I think that one essential part of objects, the fact that objects are meant to be handled, that's something which I think all museums struggle with. Mm -hmm. In a university museum, like my past one, it was wonderful because the whole point was to handle objects. That's what drew me into Greek archaeology when I was a student. You know, rather than reading black text on white paper, you actually could hold something 2,500 years old in your hand. That was far more direct evidence, far closer to the manufacturer than an Oxford edited text, which has gone through many editions and who knows what redactions to get to your, your, the text you have there. An object is truthful because if it's genuine, it is directly from that time period. I think as a museum, from our point of view, what's important is that we try to make the experience of visitors as unimpeded between them and the object. Part of it may very well be taking large carpets and putting it out there in the open rather than having it behind glass. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason why is that if you're able to look at a carpet and get close up to it so you see individual you know, threads, that's amazing. One of our collections, which is actually the most important part of our collection, are manuscripts, our illustrated manuscripts from Iran from the 16th century from the so-called Shatamas Chaname. These objects, we make sure people can get up to very close. Now, we still put them behind glass, mm -hmm. but we've made the display cases such that you can get within, quite literally, one to two inches of the object. And I'm very proud to say we spend a lot of time cleaning nose smudges off of the glass. And that shows people are doing exactly what they should, which is not looking at an object from one, two, three meters away, mm -hmm. looking at it as close as they can, because then you truly get the hand of the artist in your eyes. You get to see the details. You get to see the complexity of this work. And I think through that experience, you get back to the, the handwork. You get back to the original artist's intent. And you actually then really appreciate the, uh, the object for what it is, which is an object. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you'd see them in illustrations, and you lose all of that. In museums, the whole point is you have to see the object in as much detail as you can. And firsthand, firsthand, exactly. Absolutely. So uh, the museum itself is is an object that that um, has attracted a lot of attention. I mean, award-winning architecture and um, a community space surrounding it to draw in a, a neighborhood. So uh, also understanding that the museum itself uh, has a metaphor of light um, in the way it, it's designed. And how do you use the museum building to draw in some of those interactions with people in the neighborhood. I mean, how are they experiencing the museum or telling you they're doing that? And what are they using the community spaces for? Sure. I think that, you know, certainly you look back upon the experience of the museum since opening. And we've had very good feedback from our audiences. They've come in good numbers. And I've been very pleased by how much, how receptive they've been to what the museum is about. I think one thing that's very important is free access. Now, we, as a museum, we do charge admission, but we do have points of free access all the time. So, for example, when you want to come into the building, you don't actually have to pay for anything until you go into the galleries. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to see an important piece of civic architecture, 
you know, the museum is actually available for everyone to see. You just have to come to the museum, walk in, wander the spaces, see how Professor Maki has designed the building around the concept of light, and appreciate actually some subtle design details which come out when the sun is shining and the mashrabiya pattern is cast across the walls of the museum. This is an experience that you don't find in most buildings in most cities and that's there available for them to see. We actually have some of our collection also on, you know, also on display free of charge, our collection of ceramics, the so-called Belle Reve Room, which pays tribute to Prince Sajidun Aga Khan. That is there free of access. We have Wednesday evenings when we allow people in for free. These are very important because I think that if you want to truly engage with the public as a whole, you need to have moments when uh, they can come in and see it without an economic barrier in front of them. Mm -hmm. Now, what's also important for us is the park. That was inaugurated on the 25th of May, so it's relatively new. But we want the space to be viewed truly as a park in Toronto. Um, yes, it's not owned by the city, it's, it's, actually, it's actually part of this entire complex, but it is a public space. And we want it to be, in a sense, a magnet for communities that surround the museum. And so I want the Aga Khan Park to be viewed as a true community space. We're doing a few activities this year, one of them to commemorate the Pan Am Games when the Pan Am flame is coming to the site. This is important because we've invited uh, the communities surrounding the museum to actually be part of this. And the whole ceremony is to celebrate the Pan Am Games, but it's the communities around the museum that are the ones who are organizing it and participating in it and driving it. That's neat. Uh, the, other, the other part of the light metaphor is darkness. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we'd probably agree that the darkness is the ignorance, that the relative ignorance we have of different cultures and different civilization at times. What are some of the things that you're consciously wanting people to understand about Muslim civilizations and those interplays of, of how they've interacted with other civilizations around them? Well, for me, I think the beginning point is for people to come in with an open mind. I think that when you come to a museum like the Aga Khan Museum, this is a chance to learn. Mm -hmm. And you can go to almost any museum and there are learning experiences, but the focus that we take, which is on diversity, multiculturalism, pluralism, now that's an approach that you don't find in most museums, let alone most institutions. That's really the opening point for us, because a visit to this museum isn't just about learning about Muslim civilizations, their arts and their cultures. It's about learning about multiculturalism, diversity, and pluralism. And from that, I think that so many doors then open. I think that when you come see our, our exhibitions, and again, our temporary exhibitions bring in so much more than what's on permanent display, you, know, you look at the types of exhibitions we bring in, and they truly do open the lid upon the fact that the world was highly interconnected over time. And that if you want to find links between Western and Northern Europe and the Muslim world, it's there. If you want to see the links between China and the Muslim world, it's there in an exhibition on the Lost Tao. Performances are another major area. Um, we talked a lot about this museum in terms of objects, but we're also about the living arts, music, song, dance. And there too, if you simply attend some of the performances, there you can realize not only the diversity of cultural forms of expression, but you can also understand how you know, that expression carries on to people who live in Canada today. Yeah. Yeah, Canada is also a country with Muslims. And what's amazing is that they come to this country, they come with their traditional crafts, techniques, aesthetics, and it changes based on their Canadian experience. And what you find here is uniquely Canadian Muslim. Hmm. And there you can see some remarkable creativity. And the lightness, I think, that comes from all of this is the fact that many of these things you may never have experienced before, living in Calgary, living in Toronto, living in North America, but it's all there. And a museum like this is, in a sense, one of these rallying points whereby a lot of this artistic creativity can actually be shown to people, perhaps for the first time. Mm -hmm. 
I'm interested in the theme of connections that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. That because when we think about the the crossroads that the Middle East and Muslim civilizations represented throughout much of our, our interactive history. Uh, there's been periods of, of long-term stability and peaceful interaction and the types of, of civilizational connections that, that you were talking about, but they're often bookended by very deep and, and dark clashes, not necessarily of civilizations, but of, of particular issues in, in a moment. And, and I'm just wondering, when we talk about the pluralism and other connections that are, that are drawn there, what can we learn from the periods of stability about how we rebuild those connections after, after those demarcation points? Absolutely. I think what you talk about is the fact that, uh, you know, peace is never as, uh, as uh, um, peace is never gets the headlines as mm -hmm. much as conflict. Yeah. And uh, whenever you look historically at the past, it's always about conflict periods, this, that happening, wars, uh, clashes, but peace is the period which is actually longer, it's actually more meaningful, but it's what people never really talk about. And that's where I think that if you want to understand the real benefit of these periods of stability, you just have to look at some of the objects, some of the transfers of knowledge that you find in objects. You know, let's take, for example, the spread of science, the spread of philosophy. You know, all of this happened through interactions between the Muslim world and the classical Greek and Roman world, the Byzantine worlds, where you had scholars who had access to books or uh, scrolls, as they were, from libraries in places like Alexandria and elsewhere. And what they did was, in their quiet studies, uh, they simply read these texts, they translated them, and they wrote them down in Arabic. And those texts were then preserved in libraries. They were then copied, distributed, disseminated. And one of the great things about this is that it shows you that in order to build up scientific knowledge, even philosophy, you don't just create it overnight. You have to build upon what's there from the past. And if a civilization tries to build it from scratch, they'll fail. But if they learn from others and from those who preceded them, who are undoubtedly going to come from other cultures, that's when real advancements happen. And I think that when you look at libraries that were formed in places like Iran, um, in Iraq today, you know, these, these cultures looked at what was being done elsewhere, and they learned from it. And one of the ironies of all of this is that, and I can tell this to you as a classical historian, there are so many philosophical texts, so many literature, so many pieces of literature from the classical world where we actually get the primary information from Arabic texts, simply because they're the ones that were preserved. They came a bit later. They translated what happened from the classical world. But a lot of those classical manuscripts have simply disappeared. And so I think if you want to see the benefits of peace and stability, look to science and knowledge because it's all there in front of you. Another great example is simply looking at the flourishing of artistic styles and centers of production. Um, in times of conflict, I think the arts always take the hit. Mm -hmm. But art in you know, manufacturing things, beautiful things, creatively, it requires stability, it requires patronage. And when you see some of the great works that come out of the Muslim world, these are all happening during periods of stability, perhaps during, you know, perhaps during the Safavid period of Iran. And you have court patronage, you have, you have enlightened rulers who say, look, the arts are actually a very important part of culture of today. And as a ruler, um, one of my responsibilities and roles is to actually promote this and to get artists trained and working to create some of the greatest works. Again, all of this is the sort of material that comes during periods of stability rather than periods of conflict. It does, and I think it's a, an interesting expression of the, the pluralism ethic and uh, the diversity that, that these civilizations allowed that, that a lot of people wouldn't necessarily associate, right? Mm -hmm. Because we, most people are viewing these civilizations through the events of today versus their true context. Certainly. And, 
Um, if you compare a little bit, for example, the way that Western civilizations were burning those same texts and, and oftentimes trying to expurge them or expunge them from the, um, from the, the cultural conversation because they challenged other things. In, in Muslim civilizations, they seem to have been embraced and shared and, and taken in a different direction. Is that an accurate depiction or is it... I, I think it all depends on time and place. Iconoclasm, I'm afraid to say, um, has no bounds, barriers. Mm -hmm. It has no, it, it's equal opportunity, so to speak. Iconoclasm can happen anywhere, and you can certainly see within the Christian world um, how um, peri during periods of time, um, symbols, forms of ex expression were suppressed. Mm -hmm. But what usually I find amazing is that after periods of iconoclasm, there's usually a reflourishing, yeah. a renaissance that happens. And that's something that I do take as one of the hopeful um, lessons to take from history, that you can never truly ever erase something. Because if it's there in people's memories, if it's there in other forms as artifacts, it will live on. And so even though you may have periods of time when there is destruction happening, and you can certainly look at the politics in the world of today, sites such as Nineveh and potentially Palmyra, even though there may be destruction today, that can be reversed. It can be recovered. The information is still there. And as unfortunate as it is, you can't erase history. Mm -hmm. there's, there's always a Canadian question about why a museum like this in Toronto it's an incredible gift to the to the city, um, but there's also I understand a very large population that 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 can draw on that maybe other Canadian cities wouldn't. But how do you want to invite those wider populations into Toronto to to experience the museum? Certainly, I think that when you look at why this museum was placed in this country, that's that's the question to look at first and foremost because. A museum of this sort could have been built anywhere in the world. And His Highness, the Aga Khan, when he was deciding where to locate this museum, well, first of all, he had to have the commitment and idea to create a museum, but placing it is the next big issue. And that's quite an unusual um, opportunity to have because most people, when they create museums, already have a site located. They know where they're going to put it in one location. But with the Aga Khan, he had a choice. It could end up almost anywhere, London, Paris, Geneva, somewhere in the Middle East, somewhere in, in Central Asia, or perhaps even India and Pakistan. But Canada was chosen very deliberately. And the reason for it is very much down to the ideas of this museum, the outlook of this museum. Uh, this museum, as I mentioned before, is about diversity, multiculturalism, and all of it underlining principles of pluralism. And when you look at Canada, Canada embodies these principles and it's not simply buzzwords. It's not simply nice ideas. It's actually lived by people. You know, the fact that this country is a very, you know, it, it takes in very large numbers of immigrants shows that it's willing to actually look at how society will change over time. It doesn't view uh, immigrants and new cultures coming in as a threat. It's an opportunity. And that actually is very interesting because in a sense, you're, you're creating an alloy. You're creating metals that are mixed together, but out of that you come up with a stronger metal. And that I think is very much the reason why Canada was chosen, the fact that as a country, it's perhaps one of the most successful examples of diversity and multiculturalism you can find anywhere in the world. I often have told people that by placing it in Canada, um, the one question that we've never had to face was, why are you putting an Islamic art museum in this country? People don't ask us that question. What they ask is, what can we learn from it? What change is it here for? And that's something that I have to say has been very enlightening for me because, you know, in the nine months since we've opened, I've never had a question, you know, or uh, you know, someone asking, why has this come here? There's appreciation of it being here, and so 
the next step for us is really understanding how we can change people's perception rather than defending why it's here. Mm -hmm. And that to me is a very important reason for why Canada was chosen. It's, it's, you know, it talks about the nature of this country itself. Now for people in Calgary, it's a long distance to Toronto, we know this. But as a museum, you know, we are there about ideas and outlook. And we want to have impact beyond simply the greater Toronto area. That's one reason why I'm sitting here with you in Calgary. Mm -hmm. uh, one reason why we come out here. Because we want to build up a local network of supporters, what we call a chapter, like an alumni association. And the point of that chapter is we want people to you know, not only support the museum, but also to become supporters of the arts in Calgary. But they're going to be supporters of the arts in a different way. They're not just there because they like the arts, because they're used to going to the arts. We want them to also embody the principles of diversity, pluralism, of connecting cultures. And as a, as a, as a group of people, um, they'll be art supporters, but they'll be hunting out, they'll be searching for venues, for museums and institutions that embody similar principles. Perhaps they may help fund some of these activities. Mm -hmm. Perhaps they may find for us some wonderful local artists who we can actually bring to Toronto because they too embody this idea of multiculturalism and diversity. Those interactions are incredibly important in, in terms of building understanding and building connections. And one of the things when we visit a museum and, and look at objects ourselves, we have the dialogue inside our own head much different experience if we're encouraged to talk with others about what we're seeing. <laughs> and, and so is there, is there an attempt, I mean, both for visitors at the museum to um, have that facilitation or animateur sort of approach to, to get people talking about what they're seeing versus just looking and, and yeah. thinking? I have to say that from my experience, the best museum experience is never done alone. It's always done with other people. When you look at people going to museums, they usually go with a friend, family member, someone they want to talk to. And uh, it's always encouraging when you see people stop in front of an object and they have a conversation. Now at our museum, uh, one of the things I'm very pleased by is that we offer guided tours. And I'm pleased to say that our guided tours are taken up by one third of our visitors, which I think is unprecedented for any museum anywhere. Um, Part of the reason for that is that we do have an army of volunteers who have been trained to talk about the collection. And people sign up for these tours, they go on it. And the experience they receive is just so much more heightened than going to the gallery alone. I think the reason for this is very simple. It's engagement, it's dialogue. Mm -hmm. It's also the fact that, as with all museums, there's only so much we can put onto one of these small little labels. But when you have a person who can actually well, give narratives, but also take questions. That's what really gets the dialogue going. And I have to say that one of my goals is to increase that rate of people taking guided tours, because it is without question one of the most successful ways of delivering content, but also giving people a fantastic visitor experience. And what are some of the dialogues people are having about what they're seeing? So we. we you know, obviously your guides have a chance to do that, um, um, but you have a chance to listen into the conversations people are having with one another. What are their reactions to it? I think most of the reactions we've had is simple astonishment. The fact that what we tell, what we put on display, people have never encountered before. You know, when you look at the arts of the Muslim world, it's a field that's relatively young. You know, most museums nationwide have almost no examples of Islamic art anywhere. Um, you know, I think that Islamic art museums are a relatively recent phenomenon. Uh, collections, I think a lot of museums are struggling to find them because they're not part of mainline, mainstream collecting. Well, nowadays they are. And uh, I think that that's what we're getting from people. Astonishment at what they're seeing, a realization that when you look at the arts from uh, the Muslim world, it's highly diverse. It's very different to one another. Um, it, it really varies region by region. Iranian art doesn't look like Indian art. 
It doesn't look like what happens out of Ottoman Turkey or Spain. There's a lot of diversity there. And I think that from that astonishment of really discovering that there's so much difference, I think one of the real learning outcomes people have is that the Muslim world is truly a diverse place. I think they're also astonished at how much interaction there is, whether it's with China or with Spain and Europe itself, Northern Europe, with Africa. Uh, you know, there's so many connections that you can find with the objects that I think the connections are actually something that people pick up on very easily because they may be familiar with Chinese porcelain or Western paintings and suddenly something that they know is connecting them to something that they had never seen before. That's the power of connections. It is. So two final questions. One is maybe, maybe hard to do so given the, the breadth of objects that you have, but is there one object that's a particular favorite of yours that really tells a powerful story for you? And secondly, in the theme of TEDx, what is the idea worth spreading that that object or, or the museum itself is, is trying to get out there? Sure. Well, I always go back to the astrolabe. It's one of the first objects I ever encountered from the collection. I actually saw it in Berlin when the collection was on tour, well before I was ever involved in the museum. But when I saw it, I was absolutely astonished by it because, you know, the narrative, three cultures all represented in one object in Spain in the 14th century. That is absolutely incredible. And I think that what that object symbolizes is the fact that when you look at objects, when you truly understand um, their beauty, but also their contexts, there's a world of discovery that's out there, one that will confound what you currently know about the world, because it's primary evidence. It's not written by a historian. It's actually there in front of you. And I think it's from experiences with objects directly that you can truly understand that the world is much more diverse historically than we ever imagined. And that what we have in this world today, what we think is being so utterly modern, actually have precedence in the past in almost every single regard. So what's the idea worth spreading um, beyond, beyond the object? Is, is there one? Well, uh, for me, the idea that's worth spreading is really cultures that connect. And that's what we as a museum stand for. Uh, with everything we do, whether through performances or through exhibitions, we want people to realize the importance of cultural connections both today and in the past. I think w through cultural connections, you, know, you start learning more about the people around you. You may even learn something about your own context, about yourself. And it's through that that you appreciate diversity, you appreciate the differences that are out there, and you actually revel in them. And that to me is, I think, what's very exciting. The fact that you know, through all of this learning, through the, through the arts that we put forward, you can actually open up a world that you may not have known before, and it is actually relevant to you today. Thank you. That was Dr. Henry Kim, one of our remarkable people. Thank you very much.